to you about Kristen Gilbert, or as she was otherwise known as uh, the Angel of Death. This story absolutely horrified me for more reasons than one. Being a medical professional myself, I know how easy this could have been for someone, so let me tell you about it before I start yammering. Anyway, Kristen Heather Strickland was born November 13th, 1967, to her parents, Richard and Claudia, and she was the oldest of herself and her little sister, and she lived to be, um, or appeared to be raised in a pretty well-adjusted home. Richard was an electronics executive, and Claudia was a stay-at-home mom and a part-time teacher. For reasons that I couldn't find anywhere, the family moved from Fall River, Massachusetts to Groudon, or Groudon, or some way that I don't know how to pronounce Massachusetts, and Kristen lived out her preteen years without any significant problems or issues. As Kristen grew older, her appearance becomes more refined, as most teenage girls do, and she had this naturally sophisticated air about her that many people admired. She was smart. She was a member of the math club, and she was pretty, but she had one pretty major flaw. She was a pathological liar. She told her friends all sorts of strange things, but the biggest one that I could find reported was that she was a distant relative to a possible axe murderer, Lizzie Borden. And she also managed to convince some of her college roommates that her mother was an abusive drunk, which was not true. But lying came so naturally to Kristen, it was hard to be able to tell the difference between her truth and her lies. Ex-boyfriends described Kristen as strange and controlling. She eventually exhibited a pattern of verbal and physical abusiveness. She would try to get attention by faking suicide. Or when she was angry, she would tamper with their cars or physically attack them and scratch them with her fingernails. She even left one boyfriend a note feigning suicide attempt by saying that she had eaten glass. And strangely, the closer people came to know her, the more they seemed to try to get away from being her friend. One friend even kind of recounted the fact that Kristen showed up to a party in a blouse that this friend had noticed had gone missing, and Kristen swore it wasn't the friend's, that it was her own. Nevertheless, she excelled academically. She, in fact, graduated high school a year and a half early with high honors. She then enrolled in state college and majored pre-med. While in school, she got a job as a home health aide with a visiting nurses association. And during her time there, she scalded a child with hot bath water. She, in fact, burnt this little boy over 60% of his body, but she was never prosecuted for this incident. She had a rough time at college. Um, in 1986, she started out at Bridgewater State, and after a fake suicide attempt, they made her go to psychiatric treatment. Um, and because of this, she transferred to a different community college, and then to another community 
was the type of coworker that remembered people's birthdays. She organized gift exchanges. She seemed to be the social butterfly of the Z ward. And her superiors rated her nursing skills as highly skillful, and they noted how well she reacted during medical emergencies. All in all, things in Kristen's life seemed just a-okay. At least, that's how they seemed. In 1990, the Gilberts welcomed their first child, a boy. And after returning from maternity leave, Kristen, swi Kristen switched to the 4 p.m. to midnight shift on the Sea Ward. And almost immediately, things started to get really strange. During her shifts, an unusually large number of patients started to die due to cardiac arrest. This, in fact, almost tripled the rate of deaths during the previous three years. And during each incident, Kristen's calm and competent nursing skills shone, and she won the admiration of her fellow co Unofficially, the 
C ward was under the close eye of a handful of nurses that were assigned to it. And under Kristen's care, four patients were dead and three others had succumbed mysteriously to near fatal heart failure. Added to that was this inexplicable shortage of epinephrine. Although many of the patients who died were elderly and in fairly serious condition, there were patients who, although sick, had no history of heart problems that were dying of cardiac arrest. In December of 1994, Kristen offered a vial of epinephrine to a fellow nurse who suffered from asthma. This left little doubt as to who was responsible for the shortage. Um, it was in a locked cabinet, so only the nurses would have had access. But perhaps the event that raised the most suspicion and absolutely appalled me um, was February 2nd, 1996. Kristen was anxious to leave work to meet with Peralt and asked her supervisor if she could leave early if her patient died. She was told yes, which I cannot believe, and within the hour, the patient was dead. Forty minutes later, in fact, Kenneth Cutting, who was blind and had multiple sclerosis, died forty minutes after she was told she could leave early if he died. Authorities have said that Kristen was on duty when 37 of 63 patients in her ward died, and empty ampules of epinephrine were found near where Kenneth Cutting died. On February 15th, an AIDS patient who was being treated with antibiotics suddenly passed out after Kristen flushed his IV lines. And this is where the three nurses on Ward C decided they had to do something, so they decided to report their suspicions. It did not take federal investigators long to figure out the common thread to many of the deaths on Ward C was Kristen Gilbert. In the seven years she worked at the VA hospital, 350 deaths occurred during her shifts. Statistically impossible to attribute to coincidence. But again, no one could believe that the smart, controlled, pretty young nurse could be doing this. Was she capable of murder? Even when a delusional war veteran refused treatment in her ward because he'd heard the rumors, he said, people are dying around here for no reason. Everyone's talking about it. The patients, the staff, the staff is talking to the patients about it. Kristen went unsuspected. The man was, after all, unwell. He was later injected and killed by Kristen Gilbert, his attending nurse. Authorities interviewed all of the employees on Ward C and put together a absolutely horrible but completely believable motive as to why the death rate had tripled. According to prosecutors at the trial, Kristen stole the epinephrine from the hospital stock and used the drugs to induce massive heart attacks in her victims. Why? Kristen administered epinephrine to the patients so that her lover, James, would be summoned to the ICU, where she could be close to him and impress him with her skills as a nurse. What? This also allowed her to flirt with him, as was witnessed by some footsie playing that several of her co-workers noticed. Meanwhile, she is put on hold, and they are investigating everything, and while she's not working, the death rate in Ward C drops back to normal. And when Kristen left the hospital, her relationship with Mr. Peralt began to dissolve. Um, James, sorry, I like to use her as names. At first, he kept her informed as to what 
by June of 1996, he decided he had to end the relationship, and this decision did not sit well with Kristen. She tried unsuccessfully to convince him to change his mind, and in fact, on July 8th, 1996, she overdosed and was admitted to a hospital psychiatric ward. While in the hospital, she phoned James and told him, you know I did it. I did it. You wanted to know. I killed those guys. He did tell the proper pathways about her confession. Her behavior became so unpredictable. She was convinced that her lover James had turned against her, and she was growing desperate. So she purchased a device to disguise her voice, some kind of toy, and she called the VA hospital while James was on duty and told him that three bombs were set off to go off in two hours in building one of the hospital. Employees and patients, many of whom were sick and elderly, had to be evacuated and the police had to be called. Of course, no explosives were ever found, but similar threats were made to the hospital the next day, and like two days later, all during James's shifts, and it wasn't long before the police linked Kristen to these calls. She's a complete wackadoodle. She was arrested and tried and convicted for this apparent attempt to divert this investigation against her. She served 15 months in federal prison for falsely phoning in a bomb threat to a federal institution. What she hoped to accomplish by this bomb threat is completely unclear. During her prison term, the federal investigators exhumed several of the bodies of people who had died while Kristen was on shift. And just as the nurses feared, the toxicology reports proved epinephrine was located in their tissues, and since that drug had not been prescribed to any of the victims, there was no reason for it to be in their bodies. In 1998, Kristen, age 30, was indicted for murdering four of her patients and attempting to kill three others by injecting them with epinephrine. James testified against his former lover, and it was discovered that in the seven years that she worked at the VA hospital, the 350 deaths that occurred on her shift, they could only charge her with the four. Henry Hudson, age 35, uh, Kenneth Cutting, that I mentioned before, Edward Squira, age 69, and then they tagged on the fourth man, Stanley Jagodowski age 66. I couldn't find out much about the victims, which really annoys me, as you all know, but I can tell you a little. Henry died at age 35 in 1995 at the VA. He died from cardiac arrest, and it was confirmed that it was the epinephrine injection. Henry had no personal connections to Kristen. He was just another patient. He was a former Air Force assistant physical therapist. He had a mother named Julia and a sister named Christine. Kenneth, we talked about earlier, died at age 41. He also had no personal connections to Kristen. He was an army veteran. He had a wife and son. Stanley Jagodowski died at age 66 in the VA from cardiac arrest. No personal connections. He was a truck driver and an army veteran of the Korean War. He was admitted to the hospital for post-operative bowel obstructions. He only required oral antibiotics, and the nurse reported seeing Kristen Gilbert into his room with a syringe. The nurse allegedly heard him cry out in pain just before Kristen exited his room, and he died of cardiac arrest 
was originally at the hospital to be treated for alcoholism. He did not have any personal connection to Kristen, and he was a decorated World War II veteran. He had a wife and kids. During the trial, which started in 1999, prosecutors said that she tries, tries, <laughs> twice, tried to murder a person poison in November of 95, that she tried to poison a patient at the VA in 96, that she tried to cause a medical emergency by removing a patient's breathing tube in 1994. They said that Kristen abandoned a patient undergoing cardiac arrest in 95, that she asked another nurse to accompany her to check on patients and waited until her colleague noticed a patient's difficulty before raising the alarm. That she forced an untrained colleague to use defibrillators on a patient in 1995. Prosecutors said that Kristen confessed to the murders to both her boyfriend, James, her ex-boyfriend, and her husband, Glenn. And her lawyers attacked those confessions. Her lawyer described her as a normal young woman who suffered overwhelming emotional stress after her grandfather's death, which I read nothing about. The ruin of her marriage, which she did, and her affair with the hospital security guard. He said, quote, I don't know what caused her to break down and spiral to the depths where she is today, and I don't know anyone could tell you the answer to that. He said that Gilbert's stress had nothing to do with her becoming a murderer in 1995 or 1996. She did not snap. People do not snap for a period of seven months when they kill four human beings. In court, prosecutors said that Kristen murdered because she liked the thrill of medical emergencies and, like I said, wanted to impress her boyfriend. Assistant U.S. Attorney William Welch showed pictures of each of the four men, including Stanley, in a wheelchair with two grandchildren on his lap. He said that each man had a normal heart when he entered the ICU, and Kristen tried to cover her tracks by falsifying medical reports. Welch said Kristen didn't like to work hard, but she was very, very smart, and one area that she excelled in was codes or medical emergencies. She liked emergencies because they attract attention from her peers and boyfriend. Kristen also confessed her crimes, but the, de the defense attorneys discounted these and said that she made them while hospitalized and suffering from stress. In the closing arguments, the prosecutor said that the serial nurse used the perfect poison to kill her victims. These seven victims were veterans. They were vulnerable. They were the perfect victims. And when Kristen Gilbert killed them, she used the perfect poison. Lawyers for Kristen argued that the patients died of natural causes. They say that Kristen was falsely accused by her co-workers who were upset that she was having an extramarital affair. They said that she was scorned by her peers and co-workers, and you have to understand how those rumors can take a toll on people. They affected Kristen's life and colored and tainted everyone's opinion about what was going on in Ward C. In 2001, she was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder, one count of second-degree murder, and two counts of attempted murder. Because these crimes were committed on federal territory, the government could have given her the death penalty. However, she was sentenced to four consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole, plus 20 years. She's serving her time in a federal prison in Texas.
driving me insane, sorry. Um, clearly there was some other stuff going on up there. Um, I don't really know what, what causes someone to be so attention-seeking. She wasn't neglected as a child that I could find. She was raised in a fairly normal household. Um, it was a middle-class neighborhood. Maybe she felt like she was lacking in something. I, I, I don't know. I don't have an explanation for this one, and I think it's absolutely terrible. I'm trying to make sure this gnat doesn't ugh, drive me insane. I don't know where they came from. was a story. 